Well, welcome everyone to uh, our latest episode of the Guardians of the Flame podcast. Um, as many of you know, this series, we've looked at a bunch of different topics. I would say peacemaking and reconciliation is one of our kind of primary focuses, um, but also faith, politics, uh, and how to be human in this world that we're living. And so I suppose it's in the light of that, that it's a, a delight and a surprise to be, for the first time, to be using the phrase public health in this podcast. And it's a real honor and a privilege to be interviewing uh, Dr. Gabriel Skelly. Uh, many of you will have seen Gabriel over the last year, uh, um, kind of commenting and giving insightful advice on a variety of TV channels all over the world, actually. And, uh, and Gabriel is uh, just, I think, been a brilliant voice uh, for, for particularly us in Ireland and the UK. Um, but he's got a voice that uh, I think we need to hear. Uh, Gabriel is, uh, he used to be a season ticket holder of London Irish, he told me just now. Uh, he uh, loves Irish music. Uh, but of course, he's a public health physician, visiting professor of public health at University of Bristol. Um, and in the Royal Society of Medicine, he's the president of epidemiology. Uh, and I may not have got all those titles right, Gabriel, but, uh, That's but yeah, good. yeah, <laughs> but basically, and he's part of the mm. independent sage group. So, uh, I mean, there's, um, uh, much we could say, but I mean, you're, you're, as I said, the first public health expert we've had. So thanks Gabriel for coming on and joining us. It's a pleasure to join you. Yeah. So uh, we, of course, we met a couple of years ago at the Fiddler's Green Festival here in Ross Trevor, and uh, it was really a brilliant week to spend time uh, with you and talk about a lot of issues. And I, what we'd love to do in this podcast right now is to trace your life a little bit and uh, what brought you to the place where you're at now. And then it would be actually brilliant to hear what it's your insight into the COVID crisis that we're in and where do we go from here. So I wonder if, you know, a lot of our uh, episodes have, we've touched on interviewing victims or people that were former paramilitaries. And of course, you became a student. You were a student doctor at this kind of towards the beginning of the troubles. Can you just trace a little bit of what your journey was back then? Like what um, <clears throat> what, what was it like during the troubles? How did that form you? Um, yeah, I, I, it had a big effect on me. In fact, it did form me because almost from my uh, early teens anyway, the civil rights movement was starting. And uh, uh, so I, I watched as a schoolboy, and we all did in, in my school. I went to school with the Christian brothers in St. Mary's in Belfast. And uh, we were so interested in what was going on as, as young young men, I guess, in our, in our mid-teens watching and uh, sometime, well, with great excitement because we watched across the world and we watched things happening in France. We watched the civil rights movement in in the United States. Uh, it felt, and and the of course the uh, the liberation movements uh, in the colonies, in the European colonies in, in Africa, and and uh, people fighting for their rights in in Latin America against dictatorships, and all of that kind of. Uh, Influence went on right through my uh, my student life um, when I went to Queens in Belfast to, to study medicine. Uh, sometimes I, I have to remind myself, and, and I, I remind my daughters that, uh, of course, when I went to Queens, uh, we had fascism still in Europe. We had uh, uh, Franco in Spain, with Salazar in Portugal, and with the Greek colonels, and that was just in Europe. It was just such a world, but it was a world that was on the change, on the move. And there was that great excitement at that time. And you ended up taking a trip to Chile. Um, can you tell us that it was recently you were in the Belfast Telegraph? There was a kind of a picture yeah. of you there. How, how did that happen and what was that? Uh, well, I, I did. Uh, I did. I got very much involved in the student movement. I joined the civil rights movement. It was the first thing I joined, first organization I ever really joined when I was a student. And I got involved in student politics and I was very active in the Students' Union in Queens. And then internationally in the, in the, uh, uh, the Union of Students of Ireland and then the International Union of Students. So uh, I was a medical student and uh, I, uh, the first thing I did was uh, probably one of the most dangerous things I've ever done. I I, uh, I was asked would I go on a, 
a solidarity brigade to Angola during the civil war in Angola. And uh, the Portuguese, had, they, they'd had their revolution in, uh, in 75. They got rid of Salazar and uh, they, the international student movement was going to send students and, uh, and uh, medical students and nursing students to work there. So I went there for a period of time and worked with fantastic Cuban doctors and nurses, great Angolans, rebuilding their country, still in the midst of a very, very dangerous civil war. And, the, and uh, a year following that then, I was asked by the International Union of Students, would I go to Chile? And Chile at that time, Pinochet, the Pinochet dictatorship had overthrown the democratically elected uh, government of Chile. And it had uh, been a horribly repressive and murderous uh, military regime. And I was asked, would I go and make reestablish contact with the student movement and youth movements in Chile? and uh, also do a few other things as well while I was there. Uh, so I, I was just heading off when I was asked, would I um, take with me uh, a very large sum of money um, and, and give it to the Vicaria de Solidaridad people uh, who were there, a, a Catholic church organization that was organizing support for, uh, particularly for the, the, the wives, and I, well, the parents, wives, husbands of, of uh, Los Desparecidos, those that had disappeared mm -hmm. under the regime and uh, were campaigning for uh, and, and trying to help the prisoners that were still in prison. So I, I was happy to do it, but it was a scary thing, uh, mm -hmm. smuggling money in. And then I, I took out with me a lot of testimonies who had lost relatives and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, you know, very dangerous things to do, but I was very pleased to do them because that that's, that, I, I wanted to be part of changing things on a big mm. scale, and I felt the internationalism of what I was about very mm. keenly. Mm. And I think that's probably why I went into public health, Johnny, because mm. I wasn't just content. Um, I, I think it was about my second year of my six-year course, I decided I was going to do public health because I wanted to help lots and lots of people, uh, not just look after individual mm. patients, but I really mm. wanted to help move things and i had a real feeling of things being on the move wow and the testimonies that you brought back uh from chile were they written down or uh, they were, uh, yeah, they were uh, it was written material it was recorded material and uh i uh, then handed those over uh to the student movement international the international union students and they were used for solidarity okay. uh purposes and i had great help i must say uh from the british consulate in in Santiago in yeah. Chile, who knew absolutely what well, I went there, first of all, because yeah. I knew was a, I was in great danger if I'd been caught. Uh, so I went and registered and, and uh, told them uh, what yeah. I was doing and why I was there, uh, which yeah. I thought might give me some assurance. And uh, when I got this stuff, they wanted me to come back uh, to them as well, make sure I was all right. So I did come back and I told them what I was about to do taking stuff out because I didn't know I was going to do that at the time. And uh, uh, they very kindly offered to help me with that process. <laughs> so they did. They were they were oh. absolutely excellent. So it was oh. a great pleasure to go back to Chile and uh, a great pleasure to uh, go to the Museum of uh, Human Rights and uh, uh, and Memories in, in, in uh, Santiago and, and meet mm. the people there. And it was wonderful uh, to see them uh, cherishing human rights across the world. And they had a wonderful wall of uh, uh, reportage from places all over the world about uh, mm. uh, communities and countries that uh, were struggling for or had, had regained their civil rights. Mm. Wow. And uh, another little anecdote, uh, a mutual friend of ours just was telling me about you yesterday was that for your honeymoon, you took your bride to Burkina Faso which at the time was the poorest country in the world, I think. Ah, yeah, well, uh, it w wasn't quite our honeymoon. It was a, a bit before that, but it was the first trip that uh, okay. Ron and I made was to uh, to Burkina Faso. Well, Upper Volta, as it was mm. then. To, we oh. were in Mali and Upper Volta uh, because I was a postgraduate student at that time of London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And we had a friend who was working, uh, doing anthropological work uh, with the Tuareg in the uh, Sahel in that region of Africa. So we went off there for some some weeks and had a, an amazing, an amazing time there mm. as well. So I, I, I and I, 
done lots of bits and pieces of work across the world as well, being very privileged to do that in, in, in different countries. Wow. So, I mean, it, it, when you look at your broader life, um, I read one description of you um, yesterday, which was you've, you've been described as an advocate of those who've been failed by the health service um, uh, and probably also in the Republic of Ireland and also in the UK. Um, what, um, what was it in you that kind of gave, gave you that inner drive to be so motivated, you think? Well, the reason I got involved in it, because it was, was my job. So as I progressed in my career, I occupied pretty senior posts in in the health service. I was a chief minister and medical officer of one of the health boards in Northern Ireland when there were four health boards. And one of my roles there, and uh, the post was renamed director of public health, and one, one of my roles there was dealing with uh, clinical complaints. So I had to run the system for clinical complaints. And similarly, when I moved to England, uh, to a, a regional health authority, um, and I spent most of my life working in the southwest of England, brilliant part of the world, uh, five million population, and I was in charge of running the clinical complaint system at regional level there. And I kept coming across um, clinical complaints where patients were really being treated very badly by doctors. Uh, badly, not necessarily that the treatment was wrong or uh, uh, though that often happened, it was there was often negligence about it. But even if there wasn't negligence, that, uh, and they had unavoidable side effects of, of treatment or, or uh, misfortunate outcome, uh, an unfortunate outcome, uh, they were being treated badly by the system. And uh, I've I've always uh, wanted to see, and it comes from that that deeply ingrained. Uh, issue of justice for me. Uh, it's about uh, justice combined with truth and compassion, I think. Mm. Mm. And uh, I, I've always wanted to do better for people because when things go wrong for health, in health services for people, they generally uh, have this sort of, uh, my rule of three, my golden rule of three, is that when things go wrong for people, they want three things. They want to know the truth and the truth is extraordinarily important to people. Mm. Uh, they would like, if something went wrong, someone to say sorry for it, to mm. actually say, and, and someone who's got skin in the game, someone who had been involved in that thing going wrong, not, you know, an anonymous letter from a, an mm. assistant general manager and something mm. that means nothing to them, mm. so, but someone who was involved in their care when it went wrong, to tell them what, what went wrong and to say sorry for it. And that, uh, one of the things that uh, I've learned a long way is just how altruistic people who suffer errors often are. And if you deliver those three things for people, mm. truth, uh, sorry, saying sorry, that uh, apology, and, and you also uh, can convince them that some good is going to come out of it by because you're going to make sure it will never happen to anyone else. Mm. By and large, people are happy. But what often happens in the health services is we make people not happy. We turn an error into, uh, we convert it into an injustice and 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 into anger by the way we handle, yeah. we handle them. So, uh, and that is particularly true for uh, people who are, uh, you know, un unable to act for themselves. Often, I grew up. My father was a. A psychiatrist and he worked with uh, people with learning difficulties mm. and uh, I, I've always felt intensely about uh, the rights of people with disability to be treated as as mm. just like anyone else as a human being the same rights and so I got get intensely uh, uh, angry about these things and I find myself uh, gravitating towards the side mm. of the people who are not getting the right end of the, the stick, as mm. has happened, you know, recently in Northern Ireland, where I've been mm. a tremendous supporter of the parents of the of uh, patients who've been really badly abused in Muckamore Abbey Hospital, a big mm. hospital here that my father worked at, was the medical superintendent of. So I feel uh, he would be horrified at some of the abuse that's gone on mm. there. So mm. uh, I uh, and. It's not because I, I want to get into, uh, mm -hmm. you know, argument or fight, but 
but mm. these people are being denied uh, denied justice. So mm. that I mean, that's a long way around saying, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I end up working with fantastic people, you know, yeah. they're just not great. The burdens that they have had placed on them, but they're just wonderful people to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was listening to a, a brilliant little interview you did with Tommy Sands, of course, oh, yeah. our, our Ross Trevor resident here, um, which I think people can find if they look that up, Tommy Sands and Gabriel Scali. Um, but in it, you quote it, you were talking about it. We actually sang a song that you had written about, and kind of highlighting a number of kind of uh, heroes of public health, I suppose. Uh, one I saw a slide was from Edwin Chadwick. Uh, who was convinced there was a link between poverty and sickness. Uh, and that, has that been a kind of, just that kind of, when I saw that connection of the link between poverty and, and lack of health, has that been a kind of a part of a oh, priority of your life too? Of course, of course. And uh, I, I grew up um, on the Falls Road in, in Belfast, so went to school on the Falls Road in Belfast, one of the poorest parts of, of, of one of the poorest cities in, in the UK. Mm. And uh, the, the poverty was all around and it remains that way and the uh, inequality to this day is enormous uh, mm -hmm. in Britain and in Ireland you know in a lot of places uh, in a town or a city you'll find a a 10 year difference in life expectancy between people living in the uh, the best off area and the worst off area mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, and so it has played out you know all the way through that uh, that inequality is is really such a huge a huge issue and always has been and it's it is uh, to do with uh, injustice and it's to do with human rights and people's uh, you know people have a right to health i think we don't talk enough about people's right to health and health i i like the who the world health organization definition of health as a state of oh it's up behind me on on the wall there <laughs> a state of complete physical mental and social well-being not merely the absence of disease, um, and uh, I think that's a fantastic definition. Mm. If I was going mm. to approve it, I'd probably include ecological mm. health as well as mm. uh, uh, physical and mental uh, health mm. in there. Um, but um, that definition has, has really always inspired me that it is about social issues. Uh, and uh, I remember the day I decided I was going to do public health. I was sitting in a lecture theater in my second year in Belfast in the medical school. And one of our lecturers who was teaching social science put up a video about the slums of Glasgow and the conditions under which people were being forced to live in those slums. And that for me, that was it. That was mm. I had other stuff to do. I, I, mm. uh, was, I, I was going to do medicine with a purpose and my purpose was going to be changing people's health for the better. Wow. Um, that's fascinating, Gabriel. Uh, I wonder, um, I, as I was reflecting on what to ask you, um, I thought because I would say not everyone, but a, a good chunk of the people who listen to this podcast would come from some kind of faith background or they're interested in the intersection of maybe religion and conflict and peacemaking. And, um, and of course, in the world today, we're becoming more and more polarized, more and more echo chambers uh, or what not, maybe fewer and fewer echo chambers kind of too, really. Um, and we're becoming more uh, deeply divided. And of course, one of the issues that um, I think is used is the issue of abortion or reproductive rights. Um, and um, would, it just suddenly struck me that it'd be fascinating to have a conversation with you about that because um, I know that you were very involved in, in, uh, in advocating and, and trying to create a sp space for reproductive rights for women here in Northern Ireland where abortion has been illegal up until very recently. Um, and I'd just love to maybe have a couple of minutes of conversation sure. around that and like for, because I think so often there is no conversation. It's just uh, two sides that don't understand each other. What What is it for you that you drive would drive you to feel so strongly about this issue in particular? Well, I got involved in quite a few uh, issues around sexual health in my, in my time. And it, it was, uh, and you can't get involved in sexual health without running into people who take faith-based uh, positions on it. And, and I try not to be uh, at all doctrinaire about my position. My position is basically I want uh, to do my best to help people to have the best for themselves. And uh, 
that applies particularly uh, in the in the sexual health area. I mean, I, I, I'd, and be in North Down, you can't help but uh, running into um, really serious issues. And I, you know, uh, funnily enough, I was reminded of it uh, uh, recently of the early days of HIV in Northern Ireland, and I, I remember being involved in a, a, a very intense debate one day on radio uh, one lunchtime with uh, 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 a free Presbyterian church clergyman who, and this was early days in HIV, but he wanted me, because I was uh, a very senior person in one of the health boards, he wanted me to make sure that, uh, to assure him that uh, all effeminate uh, male nurses in the board's employ would be tested for HIV, and that anyone in in the area who uh, in Northern Ireland who, who who was positive for HIV that they should be confined in a camp somewhere, mm. and uh, so as not to spread it further in the community. Mm. And uh, I think that's the worst uh, I, I've come across, but I. I I got involved in in some of the other sexual issues, uh, particularly teenage pregnancy. And and when I became director of public health in the health board, one of the things, and it's a tradition going back, it's a great tradition going back 150 years at least. Well, it goes back to oh the mid 19th century, really. And uh, from that whole sanitary revolution that swept the world at that time. And uh, it is, there always used to be a medical officer of health in every local authority in Britain and Ireland. And that medical officer of health uh, was appointed by the local authority. They couldn't be sacked by the local authority, interestingly enough, because one of their jobs to do was to prepare a report every year, a public report on the health of the population of that local authority and what should be done to help approve it. And uh, they also had quite a lot of powers under the Public Health Acts to shut things down and, and uh, changes and uh, uh, if there were infectious disease outbreaks, bring them to a close. And uh, so we were given that task again to do a, a report on the health of the population. So I did for the eastern part of Northern Ireland. And uh, there was a, an alarmingly high level of um, births to unmarried uh, teenage women in Northern Ireland. And I, I wasn't particularly concerned whether they were married or not. That was their business, not mine. But I was worried about the high level and where these really wanted pregnancies. And I was very aware that uh, because the uh, 19th century uh, laws about uh, the Offences Against the Person Act uh, prohibited abortion still in Northern Ireland, that a lot of those young women who became pregnant and didn't want to be pregnant, traveled to England to have terminations of pregnancy there. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the health board that I was an officer of, we weren't providing re any decent services, uh, contraceptive services, or even um, uh, contraceptive advice to young people. There were family planning services, but you really needed to be a married woman to go there. You know, you'd be a, a brave young woman who go there without a wedding wing, ring on your finger. And the attitudes uh, weren't very um, uh, welcoming to people uh, having sex out of wedlock. And uh, they certainly didn't contain any element of counselling. And young people's sexual health has a high uh, you know, to help people address their sexual health problems as, as young people, you do need to be a counsellor much more than, uh, you know, a, a, a doctor or a, or a nurse. That's 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 the easy bit. It's 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 helping people with their sexual uh, problems. That's the important thing. So I decided we should set up a service there. So I, I knew of a service in England called Brook Advisory that was a very good young people's sexual health service. I thought it had to be different from the the well-established family planning service, great that the, that was for uh, for older women, and uh, but for young people needed something different. So I managed to get agreement for the money and the board, and we uh, set up the service. And uh, you know, all hell broke loose, and uh, there was a huge rows went on, and court cases. There was a judicial review of the decision making, which we happily won. There were. Uh, I, I got death threats and told mm. I'd be shot. I was accused of, uh, uh, 
you know, promoting bestiality and all sorts of stuff. I think the, the worst thing was I was being, I was accused of, um, me being accused of the, destroying the moral fabric of Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And this is at a time that bombs were going off all over the place and people were being shot. Yeah. And I, I wanted to help young people with their sexual health needs and I was being yeah. accused. So there were demands for my resignation and all sorts of mm. stuff. Just fantastic women who helped get the service together and great staff there uh, because it was picketed. It was picketed nonstop for oh, well over 10 years. Uh, and the abuse, you know, I, I thought the staff were fantastic. And, uh, but the young people as well. Uh, who came and made use of the clinic, fantastic, having to walk through these uh, abusive uh, picket lines mm. uh, with people shouting at them, photographing them, saying, we'll tell your mummy on you, and things are oh, just dreadful. So um, that toughened me up nicely. <laughs> I think that was, uh, and, and the staff, fantastic. I mean, they were, you know, people parading up and down with their, and I'd never seen or heard any of anything like this before in my life. It was just mm. awful stuff. Mm. But uh, yeah, but it worked. It worked. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it strikes me that uh, for those listening from outside of Northern Ireland, you're probably not aware of how deeply uh, conservative and religious uh, oh. our parts of our church fabric are, church landscape are. Yeah. Uh, and even Christian folk generally would find large parts of our our religious landscape I think so. problematic, you know. I think so. But there are lots, uh, actually, uh, it, it's not really like that. If you scratch beneath the surface, you know, people are not as extreme. But uh, it's a problem of Northern Ireland is that uh, all of these issues tend to gravitate to the extremes mm. and pe other people keep their heads down. But mm. I had an interesting time, you know, because uh, I... I met lots of people along the way, and uh, funnily enough, I, I came out of it with uh, uh, two uh, uh, surprising affections, really. One was for the the Methodist Church, because yeah. the Methodist Church were absolutely bloody fantastic, you know, mm. just great. Mm. And they listened to the case and they supported it. You know, no yeah. other church, no mm. other church showed any sympathy for it. Wow. Uh, they were very good. And they said, you know, we don't approve um, of... Uh, young people, particularly underage, and, and the age of consent then was, I think, 17 in Northern Ireland rather than uh, 16 is not. We don't approve, but it's not our job to approve. Uh, but what we what we do want to do is be helpful. And they could see that ha helping young people avoid, if they were going to have sex, well, it would be really preferable if they didn't have an unwanted pregnancy. They were fantastic. And the other one might surprise you, Johnny, because the DUP, as you can imagine, weren't very pleased with me. And uh, they demanded a meeting with the chief executive of the board and myself. And we had that meeting. And Ian Paisley came came in with uh, uh, one or two of his uh, compatriots. And I had the job of uh, explaining myself to them. And uh, I did so. And he listened very, very carefully. Mm. And his 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 uh, his uh, fellow Free Presbyterians weren't very pleased with me, made their displeasure uh, known. But Ian Paisley didn't, mm. and he just listened very respectfully. And uh, he ended the meeting, really, and he just thanked me very much mm. for explaining it all to him. Mm. Didn't say anything and went. No. But I could see from uh, that this was a man who uh, mm. had, had, a, had, a, had some compassion and, and could think very mm. broadly if he, mm. if, he, if he needed to. And then... You know, I think he, he bore, I, I was delighted when he bore that out and when he went into into the assembly and sat beside Martin McGuinness in the interests of, of peace. Mm. So I was very impressed. Yeah. Well, it's an amazing little story for, for someone who was uh, carried out of uh, Brussels for denouncing the Pope as the Antichrist. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, yeah. you, you got away pretty like, lightly there, Gabriel. Yeah. Well, you know, I think there's there's theatre. There's theatre and, yeah. the, and, and then there's... Uh, yeah. You, you know, there, there's something different inside yeah. him, I think, or was yeah. something different inside. Uh, yeah, I mean, it does strike me, your whole kind of um, reason for living there is so moral, you know, uh, and your strong purpose, passion from early on in life to help people. Um, and I think, you know, I think there are these wedge issues. And I think you're, uh, even the fact that you touched on Ian Paisley, who, you know, is a lightning rod for, many would say, for sectarianism, you know, that's, 
you know, he had the capacity to see your humanity. You obviously have the capacity to see his. Um, and there's something very meaningful about that, I think. You know. mm -hmm. um, I, one of the other areas before we get into COVID, um, uh, you, uh, and just uh, recently, um, you exposed failures in the cervical check program in the Republic. Can you just kind of describe oh. essentially what, what that was and how, again, you were, were able to be involved in that? Yeah, it, it, it was easily the toughest thing I've ever done in my professional life, really, by by far. But it was also probably the most, uh, the best thing I've done. And uh, Well, Cervical Check is the name of the cervical cancer screening program in the Republic of Ireland. And it's been running for a while, not a huge length of time. It had taken a long time uh, to come in because at that time in, in the Republic of Ireland, I think social uh, issues didn't move very fast. And uh, as I'll explain maybe later on, you know, some of that attitudinal stuff hangs around it still. But they did set up eventually a survival screening program. Uh, at one stage, about 10 years down the, the line, they decided to look back at the cases of uh, cancer that had occurred in the Republic, cervical cancer, and see whether they had been screened. Those women had had previous screenings. And if they had been screened, uh, have another look at the slides from those screenings to see had anything been missed perhaps in those slides. So they did that and, and uh, they found about 200 uh, pl or plus, uh, it, it turned out to be um, 220 odd, uh, uh, cases where the woman had developed cervical cancer and on retrospective review of their slides, um, there had been uh, discrepancies between the uh, uh, their initial diagnosis on the, based on that slide and their subsequent diagnosis, if that explains it. Mm. Uh, now, that's a difficult thing to work your way around because the screening process is just that. It's a very quick review of a slide by usually twice by two separate people to try and avoid that uh, just one set of eyes, two set of eyes. But if you're doing it for millions of slides, there will be errors made. Everyone makes error, particularly when you're making a judgment like that, which isn't a, uh, you, you know, there's no total dividing line. There, there is a, a level of interpretation and uh, screeners are taught. They are uh, often medical scientists, sometimes not, uh, but taught to do this at, at rapid pace. So they would have maybe 10 or 15 minutes to it. When you come to reviewing those slides, uh, it's often a much more senior person. They know that the woman has had cervical cancer and they can spend as long as they like looking at the slides. So it's not like for like, but undoubtedly there will be error there because people do make error when they look down microscopes and make judgments. So uh, when those results were, were uh, generated, uh, what was meant to happen according to their policy was that the women would be told of those results. They'd be invited in and, and told. And uh, for a very high proportion of cases, they weren't invited in. Uh, their policy had was badly drafted, appallingly drafted, and uh, they weren't told about this. And the results were either dumped, you know, didn't appear in their charts or put somewhere in their charts and ignored. And um, a, a, a very fine woman, Vicky Phelan, um, pursued the case about uh, her slides. She learnt, she had a hint, I think it was, that uh, this had happened, but she pursued, pursued it and uh, found out what had happened to her slides. And she found out she hadn't been told about uh, the review and the outcome of the review. And she took a, a court case, a, a liability, medical liability uh, court case, which went to the high court and uh, she was offered a very large amount of money to settle the case with a confidentiality agreement. And uh, uh, that was before they came to court. And she refused the confidentiality agreement. She said, this is, there's no reason why this should be confidential. This happened to me, it may have happened to others. And she re refused to sign it. And she uh, went to court and um, she, uh, you know, faced questioning about the effect of the cervical cancer on her. And, you know, this is public court being asked about mm. her, her sex life, for example, mm. the effect mm. it had on her sex life. Really humiliating, I thought. Mm. Uh, and 
eventually it was clear that the case was not going well and a settlement was met. But it got huge publicity then and it mm -hmm. unleashed um, lots of uh, interest then. And who else would be treated like this? And it, it sort of it emerged over a very short period that this was a major scandal. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and our, our, the Republic's Taoiseach, Prime Minister at that time, had been the Minister of Health while part of this period, for part of this period. Uh, so the government was very much uh, wedded into the, the, the system and the Department of Health part of this, this system. And uh, uh, there was a huge amount of concern. So I got a phone call one Sunday afternoon. Would I come and help them do a, a, what they call a scoping inquiry, which is meant to be to set the scene for a major tribunal uh, or, or judicially led inquiry into the issues. And I said, yes, I'll come do that. So I was appointed by the cabinet on the, I came over on the uh, Tuesday morning. I think I was appointed at the cabinet meeting by the, uh, my appointment confirmed at, at the cabinet. Uh, that Tuesday morning, and I gave my first press conference Tuesday afternoon, and then, then the pace sort of flew on from that. And uh, it was meant to take six weeks; it took me four months. And we found so much that was wrong in the system, just so much. And I got to know a lot of the women and the families involved, and I produced my report. And it, it uh, by the time I got the report finished. I had had to dig into so much uh, because it was, uh, oh, uh, everywhere, every stone I lifted, there was something wrong underneath it. And I found out so much of what went wrong. And uh, I, uh, uh, I, I, I tend not to be, uh, have a huge power of concentration until I need to have a power of concentration. And But when I do, I really have it. And we found out so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I dealt with, I thought with, I, I thought because this was taking me so long that it wasn't just good enough for me to find these things out. I would try and get find out why these had happened. Mm. So I, and I decided I would make recommendations uh, for the resolution of all of these problems that I had indicated. And I would also suggest to them, it wasn't in my report, it was in my forward, that I uh, thought the major priority was to get on and implement the recommendations to fix the system because the system was so broken I didn't think it was right for it to wait uh, a few years, which is what it would have been for a, a tribunal to, to sit or a proper judge-led inquiry to sit. And uh, and that I needed to do more work because there were things we found out about women's slides being sent to America to be, uh, to be read, which was known about, but we found problems with the quality assurance uh, system. We found problems with the accreditation of the laboratories. Wasn't They were accredited, but not the accreditation that had been asked for the contracts. Uh, anyway, um, uh, I, uh, I put out the, the report and um, happily uh, the women. And, and, you know, but uh, one, of the, one of the worst bits about the whole thing was the uh, the way in which the women were treated, uh, yeah. you know, they they didn't they they did absolutely did not want to have cervical cancer, and mm. some of them died, and some of them had their lives changed by what can be a very aggressive treatment regime, uh, you know, remarkably changed, and uh, not for the better at all. And uh, they they uh, of course they were uh, had a bitterness about that. And of course, they were upset that there might have been a chance that it could have been found earlier and treated at an earlier stage. But what they could not forgive, never forgive, was uh, not being told the truth and not being given the information. And I agreed with them. It was their it was their cells were on the slide. Mm. And what right has someone to do an analysis of, of someone's tissue and then hide the results from them and not mm. tell them what these results, significant results are? You know, you may not like the outcome of it, but mm. they deserve to be told. So I, I was extraordinarily clear about that. And, uh, you know, some of the examples of how, how and then, ah, Johnny, what happened was as soon as uh, uh, Vicky Phelan won her case and, the, and my uh, inquiry had been set up, uh, there was a system put in place that the doctors had to tell the, these these mm. women the results. But they, they, even that they didn't do properly. And a, a very high proportion of them were done appallingly appallingly uh the worst example was uh, a woman a young woman who died 
whose parents, husband and sister were brought in to talk to the doctor and the doctor told them that, yes, there had been something potentially missed on the slide earlier, but uh, mentioned several times during this that uh, uh, the woman had been a smoker. Don't you know she was a smoker? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it is true, women who smoke have a higher incidence of cervical cancer. The, the, the chemicals from tobacco interfere with the ability of the cervix to clear the virus. So that was true. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was you know, mm -hmm. neither here nor there mm -hmm. in terms of what had happened to mm -hmm. this, this, this unfortunate woman with the cancer. And he finished this uh, discussion with the family by, by saying to them, um, but you know, nuns don't get cervical cancer. Mm. And I think I, I think that uh, verging on misogyny came mm. came through on, mm. on several occasions, and and that judgmentalism, and 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 also some of uh, what I some of the women who wouldn't talk to me or would talk to me mm. without giving their name and uh, uh, and didn't want anyone to know because they never told their family that they had cervical cancer. Never, never told their parents that there's cervical cancer. Never told their children that there's cervical cancer, uh, because they were ashamed of having had cervical cancer, mm -hmm. because of the judgmental nature that, mm -hmm. of of society that they that they felt that that it was it was awful. They couldn't mm -hmm. they couldn't talk about it. Wow, I'm sure there's a much more we could talk about that, but I really appreciate you telling that story, uh, Gabriel. Uh, and it sounds like just amazing work that you did. Uh, just returning uh, one more time to a theme we touched on before, uh, you know, this podcast generally looks at, you know, our, can we be guardians of the flame uh, from a quote from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, religion is like fire, like fire, it warms, but it also burns. We're the guardians of the flame. We end our documentary by talking about the, the flame of people who have guarded the flame uh, of humanity itself, not just a system of belief. Um, and I know, you know, you were, when I, just before we were starting here, you were touching on where the link between religion and pu public health, uh, and certainly even the way you were talking about some, your work with um, cancer victims there, you know, you're, you're guarding the flame of humanity. Uh, you, you were touching on a couple of the, the word quarantine and, and uh, an example in Derby, Derbyshire. Uh, can you tell me what those were? Uh, yeah, well, many religious codes have within them elements of public health. Uh, uh, as some of the dietary um, mm. uh, ha yes. uh, dietary laws of a religion or, 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 or rules of religious observance about uh, diet, about not eating certain things, shellfish, for example, or uh, pork. Uh, pork associated with liver flukes historically mm. it, to, to a huge extent, uh, a shellfish with food poisoning of, of various sorts. Uh, so a lot of and, and um, rituals of washing, I think, as well, very clear uh, hygiene uh, elements to a lot of a lot of the rules. And uh, uh, one of the interesting and, and very relevant to COVID-19, actually, mm. because mm. What we're doing with COVID-19 is rediscovering some of our inherent uh, things that we shouldn't have lost, uh, inherent uh, rules of hygiene and how we conduct our lives to keep ourselves and keep others safe. Uh, quarantine is a, a good example when the, the Venetian states introduced quarantine, which was they knew that ships would bring plague to their shores and fever to their shores, and they made those ships uh, go into quarantine. They started off with 30 days, but they shifted pretty rapidly to 40 days. And uh, they chose the 40 days for uh, religious purpose, uh, religious reasons in that there was uh, something holy about the 40 days, about the 40 days spent in the, in the desert, the 40 uh, mm. days of Lent. Uh, 40 is a recurring theme in, mm. in, in the Bible. And yeah. that's where quarantine comes from. Uh, the, the, the one fantastic religious uh, example is the victor of Eam, if that's how it's pronounced, E-Y-A-M, a village in Derbyshire, where during an episode of bubonic plague, I think it was, the, uh, the uh, community, the very small village community developed the plague, but they knew that it had, uh, it, it was spreading by people traveling and bringing the, the plague. And uh, they didn't know quite how, but they, that they knew. And under the leadership of their vicar, 
uh, they decided that they would quarantine, but they would be in the quarantine and they would make sure that none of their inhabitants left their village to spread it to neighboring villages. Yeah. And it's just a really amazingly selfless, uh, it was an amazing selfless action led by the victor, vicar of Eme who celebrated there uh, to this day. Mm. Well, um, I, I guess that we'll move from that um, plague story to uh, the part of the interview, which is probably could date itself quite quickly as COVID changes. Although I think you've probably got a lot to say that's pretty timeless. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It'll not change. These things are exactly the same. Actually, one of the things, uh, Johnny, uh, that I find amazingly interesting is uh, I'd learned a bit about the Spanish flu at the mm -hmm. beginning of the 20th century, but I've learned so much about it again. Mm -hmm. And I learned uh, so much about those basic sanitary principles. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons that uh, uh, I've learned so much is because there's been such a rich vein of material, particularly from the United States, about Spanish flu and what happened. And, I, 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 and, and some of the principles of ventilation and of mask wearing and so on that were mm. really important with Spanish flu yeah. are again important for us and uh, not just issues that things that were important for Spanish flu but the, 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 I, I was amazed to and I've learned I knew about uh, uh, for example open air schools and I live in Bristol now and open air so there was an open air schools in Bristol until the late 1950s and uh, in Belfast there was an open air school I didn't know anything about it uh, and it was because everyone knew that uh, sunlight and ventilation were the enemies of infectious disease, and that was good for children. So I, I went, to, I think I said, yeah, I, I went to school on the Falls Road. So I went to St. Kevin's Primary School on the Falls Road, which was built in 1933 by an English architect, R.S. Wilshire. And uh, it was built on sanitary principles, mm. uh, a big uh, there was a, a girl's end to the school and a boy's end to the school, red brick, two story, big building. And uh, the building, the front of the building didn't face the road, as you would normally expect. The front of the building faced uh, down over the hill, down over uh, the meadows uh, below it. Uh, the toilet block faced the main road. Uh, it was all the classrooms had very high ceilings had opening windows with cords to open them, uh, at least windows on two sides. It was built around two in the inner courtyards. Uh, there were no internal corridors. Uh, all of the movement around the school took place in, in verandas, uh, mm -hmm. which, which were covered verandas, but open to the air. Uh, all of it was built on sanitary principles. And this man uh, was following a good architectural practice for public buildings of those of, uh, of his day, and he built lots of these in Belfast on Sandra, and we've lost that, mm. lost it completely, and we're sending children here in England anyway. They all went back in school on Monday, and they went back into small classrooms, badly ventilated, not spread out, almost no changes made to the physical fabric of schools to to cope with COVID. And we should be doing all of this this mm. stuff. Mm. Um, just not to kind of like harp on the past, but it is helpful, obviously, to learn from the past. I mean, when you look at particularly the UK government's response, what has been our biggest failure, do you think, in this last year? Um, in the last year, right from the beginning, a, a failure, a failure to stop uh, the the arrival of, of, of the plague. It would st uh, knowing that this was spreading around the world and Goodness knows we've seen enough uh, plagues over the centuries come from the uh, cholera come from the east and spread gradually and arrive with. So now in the days of uh, global air traffic, we've had uh, SARS spread uh, from the east and, and, and come to us. And, and we know that incubators of new viruses, we know where they are. We know where viruses are likely to start, start up and come to us from and not to put in place restrictions travel restrictions at an early stage, not to stop mass gatherings where, uh, Johnny, we're talking today on the anniversary of um, uh, the first anniversary of the Cheltenham race meeting, something that's mm. dearly beloved to horse racing fans, particularly in Ireland, who, who go over en masse to it. And they did a year ago. And uh, at that time, 
mass events were still allowed to go on. Only a day or two uh, prior to the Cheltenham Festival, there had been a football match in Anfield in Liverpool, mm. uh, and a Madrid team were playing, mm. and that Madrid team could not play in front of a crowd in Madrid because they'd already stopped all mass gatherings in Spain because of the virus. But the team came uh, and brought 3,000 Spanish football fans with them to pack into Anfield mm. and and spread the virus. Just crazy mm. stuff going mm. on. I think a failure also to put in place really good local arrangements for finding cases, testing, tracing, tracking, isolation, all of those fundamental public health issues where all of them failed on. And that's partly because, mm. I think largely because of a, a massive decline in the public health system uh, in the last 10 years. Mm. I, I talked about directors of public health and medical officers of public health. And actually, uh, John, you might not know this, but the only place in the UK that doesn't have local directors of public health is Northern Ireland, because oh. they were they were abolished uh, when the health boards disappeared. They disappeared. And uh, in England, they've been moved into local authorities, had their budgets dramatically reduced yeah. and their power and influence dramatically reduced. So there was a, a very fundamental deficit mm. in our public health systems that will have to be addressed. Mm. And in Ireland, of course, we're in Ireland um, and we have our own uh, uh, specific issue regarding a border. And so we have yeah. two jurisdictions. Could we have been become like New Zealand? You know, New Zealand, I think, has had 26 deaths. My home yeah. country. Uh, yeah. could, could we have been New Zealand? Oh, we could have been, you know, choose any number of islands to be in New Zealand, Australia. I know it's a continent. Uh, Japan, Taiwan. There are lots of islands that have done it, done it very well. Britain and Ireland could have been there. Mm. I, 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 I looked down the, there's a great website. I go to Worldometers and uh, their COVID site. Um, uh, it, it gives great data. And I went down the list of countries and I, I think I found 62 islands either mm. one country islands or shared country islands, with, but smaller fans. And uh, the UK was way up top, way up top for deaths. Mm. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Wow. And Ireland and the UK could easily have avoided that. Uh, mm. th and there's nothing, I, I mean, it's a huge advantage. The island advantage, I used to talk about the island advantage and encourage them to take advantage of, it, of that, but uh, they didn't. But there are some other European countries have done well. I mean, Finland has done fantastically well. Norway has done fantastically well. There are, it, it, it could have been done. And we're sitting in the UK at well over 100,000 deaths. Now, mm -hmm. worldwide, we're heading towards 3 million deaths, about uh, 2,700,000 uh, about now. It's terrible. Yeah. And and just do you have any thoughts on what life will look like afterwards, uh, lingering um kind of uh, a lingering taste, a sense of what the yeah. society will be like after? Very difficult to predict. It, it depends on how good we are at controlling the virus. Uh, and, and that is not a cause for optimism, really, because there are large parts of the world where the virus is uh, still rampaging. And even places like the Amazon, where mm. uh, it is making a huge comeback, despite having been devastating in the city of Manaus, in mm. the Amazon region. And, and, and the more the virus goes about its business, the more variants, the more mutation, genetic mutation will take place and the more variants we'll get. And the real fear is that uh, some of those variants will, and, and some of them do make it even, we know that, we, we've seen variants which are more transmissible and more fatal develop. The, the UK or was identified in the UK variant. Uh, and uh, or, or the Spanish variant, which uh, was brought back by people returning from Spain last summer mm. and is now the dominant uh, variant across Ireland. Mm. Uh, uh, and vaccines are our big hope uh, for getting this under control and, and getting back to normality. But we're so far away from getting the world vaccinated so far. It's a long, going to be a long, hard, rocky road. And everywhere is going to, and then there are problems of vaccine nationalism mm -hmm. uh, occurring and maldistribution of, of, of resources. Uh, so, uh, uh, and we are going to need to have better control mechanisms in place so that when we do get uh, outbreaks, as we will do get outbreaks, uh, we can get them under control quickly. Mm. Um, well, uh, just one more kind of uh, not so happy subject, um, uh, which is not exactly your realm of expertise, maybe, but certainly one of interest being an Irishman living in England is Brexit. 
Um, and uh, I just wonder if you've got any reflections on, you know, sitting over there in uh, in England, in the west of England, I guess, and um, and what Brexit could mean and the Irish peace process and your own journey in the past. And yeah, yeah. What, are, what are some of your thoughts about it? Uh, well, of course, it goes out saying I was against Brexit, <laughs> a terrible idea. And uh, I was uh, very upset and disappointed and, and, and uh, very grateful that I have an Irish passport. Yeah. And um, I, 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 I must say, I have not seen anything to encourage me from uh, a UK point of view, from a British point of view or an English point of view. He, even today, the day that we are talking, the government's announced uh, their intention to uh, increase by 40% our stock of nuclear weapons. Uh, has 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 made is making major major changes to our international policy, revamping uh, British military bases uh, in other parts of the world, uh, where arguably Britain has no right to be, yeah. and uh, I, I, I and that strikes me as an isolationist, aggressive, nationalist uh, yeah. policy, and and I don't like that. Uh, I think it's it's bad for Ireland. It's clearly been bad for Ireland and for community relations. And uh, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm I'm hopeful that sense will prevail. I hope sense prevails in Scotland most of all. I think uh, uh, Scotland uh, is likely, I think, to vote for independence if they get the chance. And I think that's well. That is the end of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom can't exist because there will be no Great Britain. If uh, uh, if Scotland leaves, so there will have to be a whole new rethink. And I think uh, I think then we are moving anyway in Ireland. We have to move, and we are moving. I think uh, towards the creation of uh, a new approach to living on this island together. Yeah. And you know the work that uh, the work that that you do and and all your colleagues do is an important part of that. The reconciliation work. Uh, the, the the treating people with grace and compassion is mm. really important, and it is, uh, you know, you talked about um, uh, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, I think uh, you mentioned Sachs. Jonathan, Jonathan Sachs. Sachs. That's yeah, right, yeah. the chief rabbi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, there's another Sachs, Ailby Sachs, who I've learned a lot from, and and he was a a very uh, a prominent South African member of the judiciary. He lost. A, he was blown up. As a uh, as an academic in Maputo and Mozambique by the South African Defence Forces, lost an arm and an eye. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. And and but became a major force for mm. uh, truth and reconciliation, and uh, uh, and 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 met the man who blew him up. Mm. And uh, I I love uh, Ailby Sachs' uh, mm. judicial approach and his judgments, and they've I've learned so much from him. And from what they did in South Africa, you know, and it was actually a man called Kader Asmal, who was a law lecturer for 27 years in Trinity College, Dublin, who uh, is credited by Ailby Sachs with coming up with the idea of, of the truth and reconciliation process mm -hmm. in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can see us moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. I think like everything else in Ireland, it's glacial <laughs> movement sometimes. Mm -hmm. But you just have to look at, ah, I'm so optimistic about the change, but the changes in the, the Republic of Ireland and the strength of Irish women and the position that Irish women are carving out for themselves mm. in a new modern Irish state mm. is fantastic. Mm. You know? mm. um, but the, there, it, you can always be pessimistic, you know, there's, yes. there's always, you know. Uh, Churchill wrote something once about the dreary steeples of uh, from Tyrone and Fermanagh are uh, uh, rising out of the mist in the mm. aftermath of the First World War, and about the integrity of our quarrel oh, in, this, uh, in, the, in this part of the world, uh, which 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 can stand when all the world has changed. Mm. Uh, but I think it's changing. I think it's moving mm. and shifting. Mm. Well, uh, those are good words, and, and maybe just finally. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, you love Irish music. Um, I do. I, um, we're sitting in a in the heartland of Irish, great Irish music, of yeah. course. Uh, tell us where did that come from? Your love of Irish music is. Uh, well, I, I kind of developed it very, very early. My my father 
had a very small little record player and he didn't have very many LPs <laughs> as they were no one then. And oh, they are now coming back. And uh, but he used to play uh, the occasional one with Brendan O'Dowd, a great Irish tenor. And he, he, he loved these songs. And I heard a lot of these songs. And then uh, then I. Uh, it was part of the folk revival in Ireland. The Clancy brothers were there in their iron sweaters and uh, in the north there, there were the Glen Folk Four up in the Glens of Antrim. And, there, uh, you know, there was uh, uh, all sorts of music uh, coming our way and some fantastic Sean O'Reilly and uh, then the successes in the Chieftains. And, and it was just such a vibrant scene. And also everyone could like it and all sorts of people played the music and, and loved the music. And I, I, I grew to know it in the glens of Antrim, uh, where there was still plenty of music uh, played in, in the pubs. As, as I grew to knew the pubs, I grew to knew the music. There was a great folk club at Queen's. And then I uh, I decided when I graduated, I'd come and uh, I wanted to, to get a job in Newry. I, I lived in Rostrever and, uh, and in Newry, I, um, got to know the Sands family and you mentioned mm -hmm. Tom earlier and uh, I, I uh, met so many wonderful, wonderful people who are involved in the Irish music scene and it's a great, it's a great joy and a great comfort to me and it's amazing as well. I, on normal times I, I sing on a Monday night in a session in a pub in Bristol and I really so look forward to getting that and I, I love digging and you'll have gathered I have a real interest in history so I like digging up relics of songs that no one ever sings anymore, but that have meaning and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, would you would you be willing to sing, give us a song in this format? Um, <laughs> I, I, I might, I, I might do. Uh, I, I wasn't prepared for this, uh, <laughs> that's, John. That's OK. You don't have to. If you uh, no, I, 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 I will do. Let me see. Hi, this is a song from the Glens of Antrim, from Glen Shesk, one of the nine Glens of Antrim. And uh, uh, Glen Shesk is one of the most northern ones. It runs down to the town of, Cush of Bally Castle, where my, my family is from. Yeah. And it has the odd biblical reference in it. OK. Um, which, uh, uh, farewell to your hills and green valleys. And the woods that spontaneously spring, where the feathered tribes of each species and the moorcock melodious does sing. All this beauty I'll part in this evening, with sorrow I'll feel no disgrace. Oh, no wonder it grieves me to leave you and part from your lovely Glenshesk. I am come of the age of discerning. I am taught to obey the commands. But we all get our own gifts freely and am bound for a far distant land. Like a bee, I will go gather honey. Though I wander through many's a strange place, and no wonder it grieves me to leave you and part from your lovely Glenshesk. Oh, the Israelites, they were in bondage. They murmured at their going away. They would rather turn back to their burdens and work at them both night and day. But Moses gave them the bright promise. Alas, they did sorely transgress. And no wonder it grieves me to leave you and part from your lovely Glenshesk. Only for Adam and Eve's disobedience, we all would be happy and free. But the serpent tempted Eve in the garden to eat of the forbidden tree. We all could refrain from hard labour. We all would be happy and blessed. I hope to avoid such temptation when I'm far from your 
lovely Glenn Shask. Uh, brilliant. There you are. Brilliant. Thank you, Gabriel. That's uh, very good. Well, Dr. Gabriel Scali, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your wise words and uh, a life of a real witness to the beauty of humanity and uh, the importance of uh, pursuing truth and justice and compassion, those three words that you mentioned. Uh, so thanks, Gabriel, for your time and your generosity. Oh, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure, Johnny. Thank yeah, you. yeah, brilliant. Thank you.